Hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk session 10. We are here with Dave Raposa. Dave, how's it going, man? It's going good. How are you guys doing? Doing all right. So what uh, what have you been going? What's been going on lately? Um, you want to talk to some people about what you've been doing? Uh, I have been dying a little bit every day. I have been. <laughs> <laughs> I've been no, I've been working a lot. We're doing Steve Lichman book two. The Kickstarter is coming up in October. We're gonna start October first and uh, ramping up to that. Doing wedding planning. That's also gonna be happening. Getting married in September. Uh, Congratulations! Well, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> and then, uh, what else has been going on? Did a bunch of client work to hopefully survive long enough to pay for the wedding and <laughs> and be able to work. Keep on the staying seat. through the book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much been it. Just uh, you know. Whatever I can do one day at a time. Did the tutorial, that 15 hour tutorial. That was a huge thing. But I'm glad that I've seen a lot of cool stuff from that. That's been a really cool thing. Like every day, people have been sending me what they did from the from the tutorial, looking at a bunch of portraits and people got a really good grasp on it. I was super surprised. But yeah. Yeah. It must be gratifying to like see like people improving, you know, from your your lesson and stuff like kind of neat. Yeah, I get a bunch of emails and I've just been super impressed by all the work. Like I, I don't know. For tutorials, it's kind of interesting because you think like, uh, like for me when I watch a tutorial, I don't follow along with tutorials when I watch them. Usually, like I just kind of leave them on in the background, listen to them, because yeah. I just want to hear like insights. The same thing with books that I have. Like, yeah, I, I have uh, Richard Schmidt's uh, Alla Prima. I have. James Gurney's light books and color and all that, and it's like, I'll read them and stuff, but I don't usually go and practice from them, so to see people going out and actually doing the work from those and having something to show for it and improving or just applying the technique successfully, that's really crazy to me because I just feel so lazy <laughs> in comparison. I'm like, wow, I never did shit like that. That's pretty cool. You just kind of arrived at it through experimentation. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like I wing it like all the time, like forever. <laughs> That's like my whole life. But sometimes, like listening to those, like do like do the things that like when you listen to them for a while, like like and then you sit down and you do like say a painting or something. Does like what you listened to kind of pop up like in your head and like oh that's exactly what he was talking about and I just kind of stumbled upon it. Yeah, I think that that's mostly I don't know like a. I always think that I'm the one who like came up with stuff. Sometimes, <laughs> like you know what I mean. Like if you take in things in your peripheral all the time, and then you kind of like forget you did, and then you feel like it's your original thought. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh no, yeah. that's from that thing I watched. Like I'll find myself like quoting. I mean, just in a in a general sense, like I'll find myself like quoting lines from books or lines from like interviews I've I've uh, like listened to or I've read. I'm just like, oh, that's not my thought. <laughs> the same thing with art. It's like if I watch a, you know, a tutorial and I'm like, oh, step by step, you do this, and then I find myself teaching that in my own tutorial. I'm like, oh yeah, that isn't like. I mean, but that's how everything works, you know. Like you mm -hmm. learn from other people and you apply it, and you take it into your build as a human being, and <laughs> it becomes part of what you do every day because it's so helpful. So mm -hmm. I don't feel too guilty about it, but like. Yeah, I think that it all knowledge that you take in comes into play somehow. Yeah, if not consciously, subconsciously. <laughs> yeah, there's something to it. <laughs> Dave, I'd followed your stuff for a while um, before we had actually talked, and one of the things that I thought was the most interesting was your story, like uh, kind of how you got started. And, I mean, I know you've told it like a million times, but if you wouldn't care to share it again... It'd be cool to hear. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, well, when I was a kid, I started doing art. But I, I mean, I guess I did art, like, pretty early. Like, I I didn't get back into it seriously until I was, like, 19. That was usually, like, if, I, if anybody ever asks, I usually pick up from there. But, like, when I was a kid, I would always draw stuff from video games and anime and whatever. Like, I had an interest in drawing, but... I was never the best kid in school or anything like that. I was never 
Like I, I was the art kid in my class, but I had a tiny class. It was like a hundred kids, and mm -hmm. um, for my whole school, like there was there was always somebody that I was like looking at and being like, wow, you know, my friend, you know, Dan Warren. He was one of those people. Like I met him when I was in a, I met him when I was in eighth grade, and I saw him drawing like stuff from Final Fantasy. Like he was doing these tiny pen drawings and shit, and I was like. <laughs> That's so cool. I want to do that. What kind of art are you looking at, man? And, like, <laughs> he had all these influences that I didn't have. Um, I had never heard of uh, Yoshitaka Mano until Dan. And he was like, yeah, you got to check all this stuff out. And he'd, like, show me all this artwork. And we kind of, like, bonded over that stuff. And we just drew lame anime together because we didn't know how to draw. And uh, not that anime is lame, but, like... <laughs> That's how we learned, you know. Like that's how we started. We both drew that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah. we kind of abandoned it because we got into doing other stuff. Like we'd make dumb little short films together. We'd like write stuff together. Um, you know, with my other friends, we'd be doing all this other shit. Like there was always something else going on. So I never took art super seriously. And then, um, yeah, for when it really got bad, it was like. My town was really small, and me and all my friends were just, like, really, I don't know. We just didn't care about anything. And it's kind of one of those, like, towns where you can... It's a meth town. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, like, there's... I don't know if you've heard of the town, but, like, Carver and the surrounding areas in Massachusetts is this big, like, drug epidemic thing. And I always felt like you either stay there forever, and, like, the town eats you alive, and you get sucked into the walls of your house... And you talk to the people that move in afterwards. Ooh, like that kind of thing. <laughs> just become a ghost, or you like use that to like bust free and against all odds kind of stories. And yeah. I thought like, oh, that would be cool if I could just get out of this, because I got into this point where I was just stealing stuff and selling it online, and that's how I made all my money. Because I was like, you know, I come from this family where my dad always owned ran his own businesses and uh, I mean to be honest he didn't just run his own businesses he was like the scam artist and stuff so mm. like he, he, he always taught me like funny things uh, but I was like I'm not going to be a criminal forever I was like I want to do something legitimate and <laughs> I had only like stole stuff from stores and sold it online and I felt like really bad about it because I was like this is lame like I'm going to be a nobody I'm going to let this like little tiny suburb world like eat me, just be this lame guy who lives here forever, stealing like fancy clothes and selling it on eBay. So I got caught. Um, I went to court for a year, and it was grand larceny. So uh, it was going to be like a felony charge, and I was super scared because uh, everybody told me that's like a five-year sentence. So. That kind of like kicked my ass a bit, and I was super hyped after that to do something else. And I was like, what am I good at? Like, what's the one thing I'm good at where I don't need a job? Like, I don't need to apply and be like, here's my record. Please don't hire me. Like, and that was <laughs> art. So I was like, I could do art. Like, I like to do art. And I was like, I'm just going to put everything into this and hopefully make something of it. And, yeah, that's what I did. I just, like put all my eggs in that basket and was like, there's no plan B. Let's just do this 100%. And I studied, like, all day, every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had support from, like, my dad. And he really believed that I could do it, but nobody okay. else did. <laughs> like, everybody else in my town, like my friends. Like, even Dan was like, you know, yeah. like, what are you doing? You're going to go to school for that. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> I, I've been on conceptart.org. You don't need to go to school for that. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I yeah. just kept studying every single day until I eventually, you know, I talked to a lot of people in the community online and eventually got to the point where I put my stuff everywhere, like everywhere. I put it on every, I typed in on Google looking for work because I was hoping to find any kind of section online where you could look for work. And mm -hmm. I posted in, I posted my portfolio in every single one of those and I was like, I'm looking for any kind of art job and uh I contacted people all the time. I started talking to this group called Power Glove when I was 18. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are like a video game metal cover band. 
they got pretty popular later, but like that was when they were still doing small stuff on they were just like existed on MySpace. And uh and they hired me to do their cover, which was really cool. And um, you know, I did all their covers since then and their t shirts and stuff. But like that was my first job job and then from there I just got these little small things until eventually got into D and D and from there, video games and everything else. But yeah, that's pretty much the summation of it. It's basically the Rocky of art stories. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it's not that bad. Like, it's just, it's more lame than anything else. Like, it's, I don't know. Like, I don't really consider that any kind of hardship. Like, I did have support. Like, it was hard to do it, but, like, it was more just me being stupid. <laughs> and then not being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess you gotta you gotta make mistakes in order to like learn, bring yourself up, and then improve on what. Yeah, I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have done anything in art if bad shit hadn't happened. Like, I wouldn't have had that kick in the ass. It's too easy to get comfortable and just do whatever. Like, just live the same way you've been living, and <laughs> do yeah. that forever until somebody kind of like shakes it, and you're like, oh wait, fuck, what am I doing? Mm. No, definitely. It sounds like you really, like, uh, you also kind of, like, applied that, I don't know, like, that uh, external motivation to, like, uh, like, you brought that in with the Crimson Daggers afterward, where it's like you started to maybe get some client work, and then you started that group, I guess, and that pushed you to keep getting better, and... Yeah, the Crimson Daggers, that was part of the old study kind of montage-y thing. But when I was a, when I was a kid, another thing I did all the time was I skateboarded, and I skateboarded for, like, 12 years. So, like, I, every day I would, after work, like, I worked at, like, Domino's Pizza. <laughs> like, after work, I'd skateboard in the parking lot. And I would skateboard for, like, eight hours straight. And I would practice the same tricks over and over and over. And, you know, I'd land them eventually. But I think skateboarding is, like, one of the best lessons I learned from just self-motivation was that if you dive into something and you put all of your effort into it and you just are constantly practicing like you're going to see results and that's where I think I, I learned that kind of art mentality that like study mentality from and uh, I applied it to the Crimson Daggers where I was like okay I'm going to put real stakes and just say that you know to everybody on here on the live stream because Crimson Daggers was a live thing and I, was, I said you know I'll be here every day I'll be here at, what is it, like 9 a.m., I think, or 8 a.m., and um, I'll be here for like at least an hour studying with you. And the point of it is that you're going to see me grow as an artist to the point where I can't do this anymore because I'm so busy. Like, that was the plan. And mm -hmm. so I just dedicated to that and did it for, I don't know how long it went straight, but I guess it was like a couple of years. I only took like a couple days off in the first year. And... Uh, yeah, it was a really good process. Uh, it helped me like a ton. I definitely wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if it weren't for that community specifically. Crimson Daggers mm -hmm. was like the reason that I had that extra push to study every single day. And yeah, I guess like it, it must have made it like literally an obligation, right? Because you, you you set that mission statement. People have seen it. You know, if you don't show up, <laughs> you look like an asshole. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, like, I think it was stop being a loser it. or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up! Stop yeah, I love that mentality too. The skateboarding thing too, because like you know that applies to anything. Like at some point, you're gonna have to be a fish out of water. So like if you literally wake up each day and you're like, well, I'm just gonna throw myself in here, and you know, hopefully I'll be able to swim. Like I, I think at the end of the day, like you have to kind of, you know, go over that just, precipice and make that leap. Yeah, you don't want to be afraid of looking stupid. It's like yeah. you got to get over that. Like you got to bomb. Like you got. The best part about that, I think, was that there was a group of people there watching me, and they got to see that I didn't know what I was doing, mm -hmm. and it made me uh, it made me feel better about it because that's yeah. something that I might have done on my own. Like I might have just studied on my own in my room, and when I was doing something that wasn't, you know, quote unquote, the right way to do it, like I may have given up. But the thing with the group was that if I just had, like, a good execution or, like, let's say, like, the study was just kind of successful, I'd have people 
they'd ask me about it as if it were a real thing, like as if it were actually how you're supposed to study. And then I would also get messages from people saying like, oh, you don't know what you're doing. Like you shouldn't be teaching because you don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, well, I'm not really teaching, I don't think. <laughs> like, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just learning. But like, yeah, I thought it was a, a good learning experience in that sense because you have a lot of people that they don't want to do anything until they're doing it the right way. But the right way doesn't exist. Like yeah. the right way to me is just a series of mistakes that people made to the point where they found something that worked for them. And there's rules to art and everything and you should learn all of that, you should apply yourself in every way, but at the end of the day, it's more important that you're just moving towards something. Like, just move towards something, because, like, if as long as you're doing something and challenging yourself and feeling uncomfortable and working, you know, towards some kind of big goal, then you're doing more than the person who's waiting to start because they feel like they're wrong. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that like, yeah. I think even social media has kind of uh, uh, brought that right way more to the forefront, like in a way where it's like, I don't know, people see that, and or you know, they see like what everyone else is doing, and they're like, I have to do this thing, rather than just say, okay, you go back to like, I don't know, late 80s, early 90s, where the internet wasn't around, and you're just, you know, you got these people that are just drawing in their basement and looking at books and trying to figure things out for themselves. And, you know, if... If everybody did things like did, followed that right way, then nobody would discover anything new. Like if you look at like Brad Rigney, like everyone would have told him the smudge thing was bullshit, and then he comes out and everyone's like, oh, you know, just because he had discovered like a new method, you know, just by experimenting and figuring things out for himself. Yeah, I love the uniqueness of people coming from their own little bubble. Like yeah. I. Like that's the that's the best thing in the world to me is like when you travel or something and you see different cultures, the way people do things and whatever. It's like all that stuff makes all the people that come from those places unique. And when everything's homogenized and it's the same, it's like yeah, you should take in everything that's good, like knowledge and stuff, but you shouldn't be afraid to kind of embrace who you already are, like where you come from and all that. Because yeah. I think that, you know, the stuff that I, I always talk about like being a kid and how you should kind of like chase that feeling of like stuff that you enjoyed in an innocent sense. But yeah. I don't mean that in terms of like literally being a kid. I mean like the mindset of not caring about what other people think. Like I like, you know, like when you're a kid and you like a shitty movie, like a B movie, because maybe it has a cool feeling about it. Like maybe the action in it is cool. Like the story sucks, the acting sucks. <laughs> Maybe everything about it sucks, but like there's one part of it that you hold on to and you kind of like, you know, there's a something to that that kind of resonates with you. And to totally get rid of that in lieu of things that are good or, you know, right, like, like I, I'll be the first to criticize shit. Like I love criticizing things because I'm obsessed with how stuff works and like I love you know, like, what would I do if I were making this movie, for instance, like a movie that comes out, and, you know, I'll say, like, oh, that's kind of shitty, I would have done it like this, and it's like, if I'm vocal about stuff like that, I'm not saying that, you know, like, other people can't like these things, but yeah. not that I want everything to be the same kind of good, but that you should be open to everything, like, open to, like, learning about why things work the way they do, you know, why you like the things that you do. It's like, and take all of that and put them through your filter and make your own stuff. Like, whenever I feel I'm, uh, you know, doing the same thing everybody else is doing, like, I get really bored easy, and I look at, like, artists online who do the photo bashing thing, and I don't think that's wrong in and of itself. But, mm -hmm. you know, with any kind of trend that goes on, it's really easy to kind of just keep doing that thing, and I like to try and challenge myself to go like, okay, like, this is what everybody else likes right now, but like, what do I like? Like, what, what do I like about that? Or like, what would I do to make that new if it were coming through my hand? Like, my vision of those kinds of things. Like, what can I introduce to this that is me without having to like follow what every single other person's doing? And yeah, I can I use scan on that crowd, yeah. 
Yeah, like yeah. how can you bring that idea into a new space or something? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that, I think that's like, the, I don't know, the root of a, like a lot of really good ideas is just like, that's why bad stuff exists. Or like, I mean, not necessarily bad, because some people may love like things that aren't, you know, maybe, I don't know. But if you look at something you're like, I would do this differently, you know, and how you would do it differently, then all of a sudden that idea belongs to you. You know, so it, it definitely never hurts to, like, question, you know, question or criticize, like, anything. And, you know, that's always just your opinion. So it's not like, I don't know, some people are like, oh, you know, you're criticizing this or, you know, that they, will get on you for it. But at the same time, it's just you trying to explore different possibilities. Yeah, you're just enjoying it your own way. Like, I literally enjoy just looking at things like, um, you know, one thing that's cool that you can do is just... You know, it's like you can take ideas and put them through a different kind of spectrum and like see them in a different light and go, oh yeah, like it would be cool if you did this in this space. Like you have like a contrast of like, you know, for me, I would like it if the guy, I mean the guy, if the Ghost Rider were a kid. I want a Ghost Rider that's like a kid in like the 80s, like this, like if Stranger Things mixed with Ghost Rider. Like I want that vibe. <laughs> it's like where Ghost Rider is always like a daredevil kind of stuntman kind of thing. Like, I want that... I want, like, the Ghost Rider character to be this, uh, you know, like, separate character than the main dude. I don't want him to be cool. I don't want the little... I don't want the person that gets infected with that thing to be cool. Like, he's always this cool guy. And, like, I think he should be lame. I think he should be scared of being the Ghost Rider or something like that. Like, I would think that'd be more interesting. So instead, like, like him be on a motorcycle, he'd be on a scooter. <laughs> Not that specifically, but yeah, yeah a reluctant. Yeah, I, see, I see what you're saying, right. though, Dave. Yeah. Introduced like a, a paradigm shift, basically, because like in reality, the, these stories, like if you change single events, like they can go infinite different ways. So there's so much room to explore just by tweaking some basic concepts within it. Yeah, so it's just yeah. like you take a thing like it already exists, a concept that's already there, introduce your own kind of sensibilities to it, like what do you like, and then just like you can make something new out of that. Like I could take that idea, not make it Ghost Rider, I can just make a new character out of it, and then I have something that's just inspired by a bunch of other stuff that I already like that I'm just combining. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just think that that's kind of the way to do it. I mean, at least for me, that's what gets me excited about doing art is like combining everything and kind of figuring it out for myself and trying to bring things in a different direction. I agree. I, I think that's pretty much how everything's created. Anything, anyway, like because you know we're we're only the sum of our experience. So everything that we conjure up is derived from what we've seen, heard, you know, felt, whatever. So in reality, any any existing IP was contrived from things that already existed as well. So it's kind of like a, you know, it kind of stacks on top of each other like that. Yeah, for sure. So what up with you, Travis? No, not much, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something I was gonna ask you about actually was like, I mean, there was a point where you were doing you were really aiming at like all the really high-end realistic stuff and then you shifted back to doing more like two-tone comics uh, what was was that like initially what you wanted to do like when you like when you first started doing like the whole like, uh, like pursuing art like you wanted to do because I remember you said you did comics back when you were in, you were in high school I think that's kind of interesting how that kind of like came full circle like you got to this high-end, high-render style, and then you kind of backtrack and say, I'm just going to go back here and I'm going to do comics and re reestablish myself a little differently. Yeah. Uh, the thing with it was that, like, okay, it's more about being yourself, and I felt like I wasn't really being myself. I felt like I was doing things that were good, you know, like what people thought would be good, because... Uh, I think it's easy to live in the bubble that you're in in, in in an industry. So I'm a fan of concept art. You know, like I was always into the... I was impressed by realism. Like I was impressed by all this stuff. And I kind of put it on a pedestal. And I worked to that point where I was like, I'm going to be an artist that can render realistically. I'm going to be able to work on all these jobs I like, you know, things I've seen other people do. That's my you know, my high mark for success. Like, that's what I'm going to call success. And I thought that that's all I ever wanted to be. And so it was like, yeah, I'm going to work to a point where I can do that 
for a living. Like that was my whole thing. I wanted to get to a place where that was what I was recognized for and that I was that person who could make money from doing that style, just like all the people I looked up to. But um, like anything else, it became just, you know, boring and stagnant. Like I did it all the time. It was... It's just like it's hard work. It takes a lot of time to put into it to make it look, you know, realistic in some sense. Like not that I'm saying I can nail it and I'm like this amazing realistic artist or anything, but like the amount of time it took for me to do that, I it started to feel like I was wasting so much time on it. Like I was just doing it to do it and I started phoning it in. I started like doing the same kind of thing over and over and over and I was getting lazy with it. I found like an approach to it where I was like, oh, if I just do this over and over, people are going to like it. And I just got into the rhythm of like posting on Facebook and just just saying like, hey, here's another painting. Isn't the lighting on that kind of real? And, um, and, you know, people would say nice things and I'd get likes and, you know, people would share the stuff around. And I really appreciated all that. I was like, but I was living in that world. I was just like chasing that feeling of, you know, internet whatever, like just recognition for stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really challenging myself to do anything new or challenging myself to like work on things that I wasn't good at. So the main problem uh, I was kind of having was that, uh, number one, it wasn't the thing that I initially wanted to do with art. Like I wanted to be like a comic artist. I wanted to do something that had some like, I don't know, some substance to it. Like, it was more than just a painting. I wanted to do books. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be able to do, you know, like all these cool comics that I like. So how do you get there? You know, I can't be doing these paintings forever. And the problem was is that I was focused so much on rendering and making everything look pretty with lighting and whatever that I was abandoning drawing altogether. And uh, I kind of, like sat in that space for way too long and I just was safe you know like oh this gets likes people want to see this who look at my work and I also made the mistake you know saying and what I just said there that I thought people actually were looking at me and that's the thing with like the small community is a lot of artists who get to some place where they feel like they have some recognition they think that that's real and you know it's it's real that people and peers and you know, they could appreciate what you're doing and they like your work, but outside of that, it's not like you're some big name artist who's going to like take a hit if you switch up your style. Like nobody the whole nobody in the world's gonna notice if you change for like a year. Like it doesn't matter at all. And, you know, you're not like some famous celebrity, like nobody cares. So uh, I was just like doing the thing I was known for, you know, like known in quotes. Uh so I was like, what do I suck at? I suck at drawing. Like, I can't draw. I, I paint all the time, but I can't draw. Like, what the fuck is the point of that? So <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to find a way to draw. And I went over to, like, that was my thought for a while. And then I went over to Germany um, and visited Marco Derjevic at Six More Vodka, and I was watching him draw on the computer. And I was seeing how he, he, he did his lines in the computer. I thought he scanned them in. I thought he did pencils and then scanned them. I was watching him draw in the computer and I was like, holy shit, that looks real. Like, it looks like your real pencils. Like, and you're, you have so much control with the tablet while you're drawing. Like, you have that line way, everything looks nice. And I didn't have that. And I was like, okay, now that I'm seeing it, you know, it was the same kind of thing I felt when I got into art, where as soon as I talked to a professional artist, I was like, okay, they're a normal human being. I can do this too. Mm-hmm. It was that same kind of feeling. I saw him drawing and I was like, oh, he does this. Like, why can't I do that? So I got back home eventually, and uh, I made my own brush, which is, well, I didn't make it. I just, like, changed some settings on another brush to try and get this kind of inking look, and that's the one that I have on the screen right here (laughs) that isn't an actual drawing. But, uh, yeah, I had this brush, and I was like, oh, that kind of looks like inks, you know? Mm -hmm. I could do something with that. And I started doing the Starville stuff because I'd always been into the kind of, like, pulpy... um, I'd always been into the feeling of, like... You know, when I was a kid, 
I love discovering stuff. Like I'd go to the comic book shop and I would look through the old bin of comics and they'd have like the yellow pages and they were like kind of shitty. The, the covers were a little like damaged and I loved the way that looked. Like that was the thing for me as a kid. I, I wanted to make like Starvale for me doing all the drawings was like a way for me to recreate that feeling like of nostalgia. Like I'm going to make this thing that looks like you could have found it in a comic bin from like a you know, like a little budget dollar comic bin at a comic store from like the 70s. Like I wanted to make it feel like that. So that was my goal, just to do something weird that was like personal to me. Like this is something I enjoyed, so maybe other people will too. And I just started doing it, and a lot of people who knew my work for the painting stuff, they were like, hey, you know, stop doing this. <laughs> go back, go back like, to what the is this? I like. <laughs> so... Yeah, they were like, go back to drawing more Ninja Turtles, dude. What are you, an idiot? And, um, <laughs> yeah, like, I got to a place doing that where I was like, oh, this is a new style for me. Like, I'm getting better at drawing. I'm also enjoying, like, making the thing. And I was like, maybe this could be a comic book, but there's no way I'm going to be able to, like, keep chasing this. I was like, I make it into a job. So I did a bunch of X-Men portraits that were from the era of X-Men that I enjoyed the most, like, early Jim Lee stuff. So I did like a whole bunch of portraits and I put them online and then I got hired to do X-Men Days of Future Past um, for the marketing for that movie in that style that I did for Starvale kind of. Mm. And then that led to a bunch of other jobs around that style. I did some Marvel Comics covers like that and uh, I did some concept art for Paragon. I did like 60 or so pieces and I did concept art for uh, uh, Amazon and I did... Uh, just a few other things in that specific style, which gave me a lot of confidence. And then I moved from there into doing the Starvale comic. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, I learned a ton from that. Like, And it just has evolved since then. But it gave me kind of just this idea, getting away from the industry stuff, that, like, nobody really cares what you do. Like, there's no – it's not really a risk because, you know, yeah. what are you risking? Like, you're risking just the potential to have – more people who don't necessarily care about painting to like your stuff. And I noticed that I had a lot more recognition for the style of it just being like a recognizable style and like that kind of inking look and the colors that I chose and the flats and everything for the, you know, wasn't really rendered or anything. And um, yeah, I don't know. Some people liked it more and it just kind of encouraged me to continually change up what I'm doing all the time. Which yeah, led to like, like, animation like, and a bunch uh, of other stuff. Sorry, it must have me. been like really like uh, invigorating, kind of like and refreshing. Like, did did it like uh, when you switched over and started experimenting with that? Did you like get rejuvenated, kind of, from the monotony of doing the paintings? Like, yeah, yeah, it felt like I had this whole new thing to kind of discover. Mm. I yeah, like I was yeah, what I was saying about the painting. I was so tired doing that, and I felt like I was just repeating the same kind of thing over and over. But, like, yeah, moving into that other space, it was uncomfortable. There was a ton to learn. You know, I'm never going to really, like, peak at drawing. Like, you know, I'm not this great artist that can draw all this stuff perfectly. So I enjoy all that. And then that led to me just doing traditional stuff and, you, know, you get inspired by people like Kim Jong Ji who are doing like this inking things just freehand. So I chase that. And, yeah, he's nuts. Yeah. The uh, the one thing like I noticed you like bounced around like a lot of like different tried a lot of different mediums after that. Like right now you're into more markers and then you did like watercolor and like pencil. Did you ever do like any like traditional commissions like for like you know for freelance or was that more just like you just you know trying different things and messing around? No, I never did anything traditionally for clients, I don't think. Mm, yeah, no, I never did. Um, I tried to on a movie job once, but it w just took me so long to do the watercolor painting that I was like, yeah, fuck this, and I gave it up. But uh, I always wanted to do it. Uh, I'm a big fan of old illustrated stuff. Like, I have a lot of really old books, and, um, you know, Arthur Rackham is a huge inspiration, and... And just like so much of the, the classic illustrators, like I, I love their control. I love the, the, I don't know, it's like the amount of 
you that you can put into a traditional piece is it's really like inspiring to me to chase that kind of thing like to just keep on I don't know, trying to remove the digital thing so that it's just me doing the work like it's just my kind of approach to it like I'm using a brush but I find that it has a lot I have a lot more control when I'm doing like watercolor mm -hmm. um, I like that kind of sense of dedicating yourself to something and and trying to nail down every single step of the way instead of having the freedom of digital where it's like you could fuck up and just go back and fix it as you go like mm -hmm. you just have to commit every single time because when I did my realistic stuff I always was like winging it and I do these quick speed paintings during my streams and stuff and I didn't really like have any personal stakes in anything and yeah. I always wanted to just chase that thing of those old kind of like master illustrators who are just nailing the style and like they just they're all they live in like this world of their own now where artists nowadays you feel like there's I mean there's definitely people out there doing it but way less people do like watercolors in the illustration world and all that yeah that's like that was something I was like really curious about because I'm more traditionally based uh, it, it seems like you can really bring like or at least I felt like I could bring a lot more of myself into that whereas like I don't know tra like transitioning over to digital was like it was a pretty harsh struggle but uh, that was something I noticed that you do with your uh, um, your line style that I really liked was that it's not like this really polished thing like you actually kind of kept like a, a lot of the like the grit from like old animations and stuff like uh, if you watch like an old episode of like Dragon Ball Z and you see, like, it kind of has, like, a little dirty look to it. But then you look at, like, some of the new stuff they have out now, and it looks like all this stuff was done in, like, a vector program. And, yeah. it, I don't know, just something kind of, I get a little taken out of that. And, like, and I, that kind of made me shy away from digital almost a little bit. But Yeah, it yeah. definitely has the risk to look samey. Like, if everything's done in the same kind of program, if everything's done using the same kind of technique, mm -hmm. then it's kind of just, you know, I mean, it doesn't have that personal touch to it. I, like, I love old animation. I love, I love like, you know, like 0083, old Gundam show. Mm -hmm. Check that out. Like, if you, if you take a, like, break down a GIF of it, like a GIF of a scene, so you get every single frame, and open it up in Photoshop, it'll give you, like, the little timeline menu at the bottom with every single frame of the animation and that's what I used to do is I would just take them into Photoshop and just look at every single frame and the timing on the frames and that's how I had to kind of like study it but you look between them and what I like so much about all that old animation was the kind of like off colors sometimes like you'd be painting a frame and then the next frame would be like a little bit lighter or like the color would shift a little bit or they'd be a little bit more like noise, or the lines would jitter and move as they did the character's face, and they were varying widths. They weren't always like the same line because it was done traditionally. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot more life to it. Like it feels alive when it's moving around. And it's the same kind of thing that I feel when you watch like a Blu-ray movie versus an old VHS. Like you can hide a lot of special effects and things, like right. shitty special effects you can hide on a VHS because there's levels of like grain, there's you know, there's this quality kind of barrier in the way that makes it kind of, I don't know, it like unifies the whole thing. It makes it feel like it comes together a bit when it goes through the VHS. I don't know what it is about that, but it's like a, it's a grain kind of thing. Yeah, it like yeah, I think it generates like, a, like an atmosphere. Yeah. Like. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a unique kind of atmosphere, but in the same way that you do I don't know, in the same way that you, like, add noise to an image to make it look a little bit more, like, real. <laughs> like, I don't know what that is. But that's how I feel, like, with animation, is, like, if you just add texture to it, you add, like, a little bit more of, like, the jitter, the movement, the off colors. Anything to make it a little imperfect ends up making it look more perfect. So yeah. I think that, like, even just doing traditional painting and stuff, you get that kind of liveliness to a piece that you can't really get like you can you can definitely get close in Photoshop and you can fake it a lot but it's really hard to get that same kind of quality like get the medium in there like make it feel like the paint and stuff yeah 
Yeah, like you have to you have to put in some extra legwork <laughs> to make that happen. It feels a little artificial. Yeah, but it looks like so much. It looks so much better. Like I think when whenever you do, uh, you you do that. Just like like you said, the imperfections really like help the piece a lot. And it's it's kind of like uh, I think this is something that a lot of people fall into is that when you over render like a piece, or you're sitting there and you're like just you know like I gotta do every single aspect of this and every single like blade of grass has to be like reflecting light or whatever, and you're just like. When you do that, all of a sudden the image looks like super rigid, like it's like a breadstick of a picture, you know. <laughs> then, yeah. you know, but then if you keep it loose and you're just like uh, focusing more on, uh, it, it, I don't, I don't know. It, it takes away from the energy of the piece whenever you're trying not to, when you're trying to tighten everything up and you're yeah, like every skin uh, pore has to be there and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's yeah, it takes. The energy, that's, like, the main point of it. Like, the the tone of the image, like, what's happening in it, that will change how you paint certain parts of it. So, like, it's weird how we have the disconnect. We, like, think of painting as, like, a different thing. Like, it's like its, its own world or something, and it has its own rules. Like, it's just like reality. It's just like us every day when we look at stuff. Like, you're showing people a window into some kind of world, right? Like when you're doing a painting, you're saying, look at this. And if you're going for realism, it's like you're like, look at this. Isn't this real? I'm trying to trick you into thinking that this is real. <laughs> so you got to think about it in terms of like you being there. You know, how, like, go outside, <laughs> get in a fight. Like, what do you see? <laughs> what do you see during the fight? What are you looking at? Like, what's happening? Are you looking at every single individual blade of grass? No, what you're was not. The part versus the blur. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like you're not going to be focused on the parts that don't matter. Like you're not going to render every flower <laughs> in the garden. You know what I mean? You're going to show the action. Everything's going to play on the action because that's what you're looking at. Like it'd be like if you were watching a video. You know what I mean? Like like let's say you're watching two bums fight on the street and you're there in real life. You're just watching it. And then somebody goes, oh, did you see how realistic that Coke can was, though, on the ground over there? And you're like, no, dude, I was watching the fight. You know what I mean? It's like, that's how you got to render things. Like, you can't focus on shit that doesn't matter. Because by focusing on that, you're saying, hey, look at this. Isn't that important? And it's like, no, it's not important, so don't shine a light on it. Don't show your skills off. It's like you'll put the skills of what you're doing ahead of the purpose of the painting. And that kind of thing always kills it for me. I'm like, realize what you're doing. You're trying to show a, a moment, and you're trying to make that moment believable. So why would it be believable that you have all of these other things rendered up and not the thing that I'm supposed to be looking at? You know what I mean? Yeah, then the focus gets lost in translation. You know? <laughs> yeah, you just... And if, and if you do render those background elements, then the thing that is the focus has to be even more rendered than those background elements in order to pop as more of the focal point than the other things that you're putting too much work into. It's like a balancing Yeah, I feel like so many people thing. forget about the narrative element of it. Yeah, I mean, you know? definitely, I fell into that trap forever. I mean, I guess I still do, but, like, you know, it's you, you forget what you're actually doing, and you focus too much on the skill. You focus too much on, like, method and stuff of, like, well, how am I going to use this technique to make the lighting look realistic on this background element? It's like, well, who cares? You know, like, just kind of imply it because that's not what you're supposed to be painting in the first place. Yeah, it's kind of like how we're talking about, like, how everything you absorb either comes up, con you know, either consciously or subconsciously, like, sometimes, whereas, like, you know, you practice all this stuff all the time, and then you have an idea for an image, and most of the time that image literally just takes care of itself rather than you worrying so much about, like, the technical process of being like, okay, i got to place this here, and this has to follow the rule of thirds to make this composition nice, and then the light's got to come in here, and I've got to make sure everything's tight, you know, or whatever, you know. So if, I don't know, a lot of times, like, the inspiration itself will take care of it, and then the study part becomes, like, more like the instinctual, just like, I'm going to do this. Yeah, I mean, like, you got to... I think it's important to kind of, like you want to know how to paint the things. Like, you want to know how to paint, like, for instance, paint grass with lighting on it, right? Like, 
in case you ever need to do it. Like, let's say you're doing stuff for a Bugs Life 3 or yeah. whatever, and it's like you got to paint grass coming out of the ground. Like, know how light interacts with it, do studies of it. So it's like you want to do all of those things, but mm. when you come back to doing a, an illustration with a narrative, you want to do the feeling of what's happening in the piece. You want to, like, convey the actual action of it or the moment that's about to take place and you don't want to worry so much about everything else like Frank Frazetta if you look at Frazetta paintings like the lighting isn't crazy real the background the colors and everything they're not real like anatomy isn't like you know yeah, the, the anatomy's all over the place <laughs> <laughs> everything's exaggerated for the sense of the image like everything is pushing the feeling everything is pushing what's happening in it it's like are you supposed to be focused on some crazy brutal thing that's about to happen then that's the whole point of the piece and everything serves that if muscles are getting out of control <laughs> like they're flexing in like all the <laughs> wrong places it's just there because you know he's trying to push that feeling of like this incredible strength of this guy is about to smash this other dude's head in. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's more important than being right. Yeah, and I mean, it really works, too. Like, uh, Todd McFarlane did the same thing, like, when he was doing Spawn. Like, I'm sure he got, like, some fleck or, like, the amount of, like, crazy, like, muscles and everything, and, like, particularly, like, with what he did with his style, but then, like, it worked for what he was trying to convey. Yeah, and you get kids who see it and, you know, I mean, really anybody, people who don't really care about art, I guess, it's just, you know, you see it and you're not worried about anatomy. You just go, oh, is that cool or is that not cool? <laughs> and you go, well, it's definitely cool, so I guess throw all that other bullshit out the window because who cares? <laughs> it works, you know what I mean? It's like when people shit on Liefeld, like, are you kidding me? Like, the most successful comic book dude, like, you're really going to try to criticize this guy, it's like, yeah, his anatomy's broken. Like, did I care when I was a 10-year-old boy looking at that stuff and getting no. super fucking hyped and being like, what? <laughs> like, look at Deadshot. Yes! Mm. Like, no, I didn't care. I was just into his drawing style. I was into the tenseness. I was into the stupid gritted teeth. You know, like, why not? I also <laughs> like Starburst, and that's bad for you. Like... <laughs> Okay. I mean, a lot of times, like, uh, I, I'd say that people, like, in the art community, like, particularly can be, like, I, I think they kind of forget, like, whenever they're doing, like, all the art and such, and you're, like, you're sitting there and you're trying to promote your work through, like, these art groups, and you realize that, you know, like, if I'm doing, like, a either a comic or an anime, manga, whatever, or if I'm doing, like, a, you know, like, fantasy paintings, you don't want to just, like, the brunt of where your response is going to come from isn't going to be the art groups. It's going to be people who like fantasy paintings or people who like anime or people who like manga. Like, you're trying to cater to, like, the public. You're not trying to, like, just, you know, throw, I mean, you can throw things in, like, the art technical groups if you want, but, you know, that's not really who it's for in the end. Yeah. Yeah, your larger audience will be people that aren't even doing art at all, probably, you know, like the people that actually see this stuff on oh. a large scale. A thousand yeah. percent. Yeah, they, just, they just like to look at it, you know, like that's... Uh... Well, like, think about it like this, you know, it, it'd be the difference, it's the difference of, like, you know, like, let's say you're super stylish, dude, like, you're basically a fashion model, you wear all the newest, coolest clothes, and it's, like, basically runway clothes where some people just aren't going to get it. And then you go into a group of, like, really well-respected scientists. It's like, do you, do you really think that they're going to be able to, like, grasp why that's good? It's like they might have some kind of, like, base for that and be like, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. But they won't know why other people like it the same way. It's like they won't know why people love it or why it works the way that it does. And, like, I think that that's kind of like, you know, when you do something very stylized and you go into a group that mostly respects just the reality of things and like making things perfect and making things like you know, their highest form of good if it's like realism then your anime thing that you do or your manga it's like it may, it may not translate it could be the best thing ever but they might look at it through the lens of right and wrong 
Yeah. You'd be like, oh, well, that's broken, or this doesn't work, or whatever. But narratively, it might work great as a comic compositionally. It might work great as a style. And it might resonate with a bunch of people who aren't in that group. And you might have the wrong opinion coming from that group and saying, like, oh, well, they didn't like it, so it probably won't work. Well, they're not a real sample of the population. Mm -hmm. They're fanatics of one thing. It's like they're all trying to get to a specific <laughs> kind of place. And yeah, they're going to be very technically jaded. <laughs> yeah, and they're going to judge things based off of their own world. So you can't expect everybody in that community to give you a real kind of critique or appreciation, whatever. Or you a know. consensus of whether this will be largely accepted or not. Yeah, like if Liefeld came out and he was around a bunch of fine artists, like, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to just shit on him. Whereas, you know, he made millions doing comics for kids. You know what I mean? Like, they don't, that's not a judge of whether or not something's going to be successful. Like, you know, like, there's some rap albums I like that are, like, experimental, right? Like, so, you know, a classical artist, like, maybe, like, a really good one be able to say, like, yeah, that's really good. But, like, some people will just be like, oh, that's just noise. Or, you know, the same thing with, like, metal. Like, if I listen to death metal, some people are going to hate it. Some people who really like death metal are going to be really into it. It doesn't mean that it's not good. It just means that it's the wrong audience. So it's like, when we did Steve Lichman, for example, you know, everybody, I mean, there was a lot of support from, like, the art community. Like, a lot of people liked it, but, you know, it wasn't, yeah. like, it wasn't, like, blowing up or nothing. People weren't like, yeah, that's awesome. Like, yeah, great. Like, many people didn't even read it, but as soon as it got onto, like, Imager and Reddit, it blew up, and everybody there who just doesn't really give a shit about the art side of things, they were just like, yeah, that's cool. Like, it's funny, whatever. Like, I like the book. <laughs> Where can I buy one? And I was like, whoa, people really like this thing. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, like, a really good, uh, another really good example is that of the uh, thing that comes to mind is that show One Piece. Have you ever heard of that? yeah. Yeah, like that thing. Like, if you put that in like a group, like a like another art group, like Level Up or something, or if you put that in front of an atelier, they'd like rip it to pieces. You know? <laughs> but, but then, like, it's like the number one thing in in the that and that area. You know, like in terms of like you know anime or whatever, people seem to love it. You know, so I mean, technicality is definitely nowhere near in everything. Yeah, value isn't. You know. Yeah specifically about quality like it isn't about like your standards of quality like you know some people will go to three star Michelin restaurants that are like the biggest restaurants in the world and at the same time they enjoy McDonald's french fries like just as much <laughs> it's like so I don't know it's just it's all over the place and if you have something that you want to do and you feel like it's not going to resonate with the immediate group try more general places to share it or whatever and you'll probably see a different result. I also suggest that for artists in general. Like we get so involved in our own little communities and we get the wrong kind of takeaway I think a lot of the time from uh, people who critique things and all that. It's like you know you might be this artist that people say is great but the ideas in the paintings might be really boring and you might never hear that from other artists who just look at it and judge it based on the technicalities. Whereas if you went to like Reddit or Imager or something like that, if the images don't have something to them, they're not like interesting or there's some kind of idea, you know, some kind of narrative or whatever in the illustration, then they probably won't have the same kind of opinion of it. It might not even get anything like, you know, like when I was a kid, I used to look at covers in the bookstore. Like I remember this as a kid going through and seeing the like Forgotten Realms or whatever, like all the old um, tour books, like D&D &D kind of stuff. And some of them I thought were pretty cool. Some of them I thought were super lame. They were like borderline romance novels covers. And like they were rendered well. The characters looked all right. But I thought they were garbage as a kid. And I'd go into a comic book store, see a Jim Lee cover, and be like, that's the shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, like, what's the point, like, spending all that time rendering it if it's really not that cool of an idea to begin with? Like, yeah, if you've like, got, like, a perfectly polished, uh, like, generic, you know, Night B, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. It can be, like, as detailed as, you know, anything, but if it's just not a unique or any kind of refreshing design, then it, you know, whatever. Yeah, it won't rise to the top of the 
regular yeah. John Knight style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, like if you, if you, I mean, you don't have its like place if you put it up in like an art group or something like that, you know. But then, like, when at the end of the day, like every time I've done like a generic goblin B or something like that or whatever, it just it doesn't. Uh, I don't know. You sit there and you're after a while, and you're like, "Yeah, it looks good, but what is this?" Mm-hmm. You just know. have to introduce something else to it. Like that's always all it is. It's like, okay, you're gonna draw a goblin. What if that goblin were half bred with a turtle? Like, make that cool. Like that's something <laughs> that takes two seconds to think of. Just yeah. A and B. People will take a second look at that. Yeah, and be like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> Yeah, this is a little bit different. It challenges you to think of something else, to work up a concept, and to just like plan out a design that's like a little off of your, a little out of the obvious that you're not exactly sure how you do it. And yeah, I mean, maybe you make something cool out of it. But that's what I did with the my marker sketch of the eyeball knight. I was like, this isn't anything unique really, but a knight's helmet kind of looks like an eyelid, so let's just go with it. <laughs> like that's it. <laughs> I'm drunk. Everybody. Are you drinking? <laughs> no, I'm just drinking. <laughs> Sorry, I thought my internet was glitching out there for a second. But uh, so now that you're getting you're getting ready to have you already started on your I guess your second book for your Steve Lichman? Yeah, we uh, we spent a lot of time on it already. You know, we wrote everything, the whole thumbnailing process, and doing the pages and. All that, like it's a, it's a long process, but yeah, we've yeah. been working on it for a while, and we're coming up to the the Kickstarter date in October, so it's a whole lot of rushing. <laughs> we're trying wow. to get everything ready, so get that foundation established. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, you know, it's a 380 page book, and uh, it's gonna be like if you've seen the last one, it's a hardcover gold foil stamp book. It's gonna be pretty. Uh, thick pages, everything, so it's going to be massive, but uh, a lot of work, so we've been working on that for a while, it's pretty much the only thing that we do, like, it's our whole business now, like, it's our life, you know, like, the, it switched immediately from the last Kickstarter, it was like, yeah, we did client stuff to make some money so that we could survive while we worked on the first book, and then, you know, we have, uh, this, you know, the Kickstarter started for that book, and then, we used whatever extra funds we could get from that to make the second book, and then, yeah, we're just going to hopefully continue that cycle, you know, where we started our publishing company, Acceptable Comics, so we're doing everything ourselves, and it's not just like working on, you know, you're not just drawing pages, you're you're doing all the logistics of shipping books, you're doing all the proofing of the books, you're, you know, you're going back and forth with people in China, and manufacturing and you're dealing with all the shipment dates and ports and the different kinds of trucks that need to go to different kinds of warehouses so it's like it's this whole thing that's uh, a little involved <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah I mean it's been it's been a really busy year and that's pretty much been like all we've done it's mm. crazy so now that you started the accept- you started uh, acceptable comics like is that what what you're gonna funnel like all of your personal projects through, I guess? Yeah, yeah. We wanted to, we were like thinking for a long time about the name because we didn't want to do something cocky because, mm. you know, like Marvel Comics is pretty brave if the comics suck, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, let's just lowball it. Let's just call it Acceptable Comics and just make it a joke. Let's just shit on ourselves. So <laughs> yeah, we started Acceptable <laughs> Comics so that it's just like, you know, it's at least acceptable when it comes out. Um, everything's gonna go through that. We have a uh, we have a lot of plans moving forward with everything, but at the moment we have one, two, three, four, four, about five books set in stone. Mm. That it, at well, after this book. Okay, so, are they all like they're not all Steve Lichman things. They're just like all different stuff, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't want to start different companies. It's too complicated. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we're going to have Acceptable, and that's going to be our self-publishing branch. And then if things, you know, we've had um, we've had people come to us and ask if they can publish Steve for us, but we want to keep it special. We want to keep it, like, 
controlled while we can to keep the standards high for the whole thing because as soon as a, a publisher comes in we can't do all the special stuff that we do or if we or if we do do that the price per book goes up way too high whereas acceptable comics is literally just Dan and myself and we do everything so it'd be too uh, too hard to get the price to like even like $25 because of the quality of it so with just us we're able to do all of the books we want to do self-fund them hopefully in the future with Kickstarter as well and then if it gets to a place where we're able to make enough of an income then we can do a lot more projects moving forward that are more involved but for now we're just doing books for the foreseeable future plus I'm sure that's like that makes you feel good like it's a step in the right direction of just saying oh this is my company and now I'm just doing like my projects through that and you're kind of you're stepping into like the idea from like going from freelance to strictly working for yourself and being able to do what you want. Your own boss, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only thing, it's just that, I mean, the only reason it even exists is because people funded it and made it happen. So I'm indebted to everybody who, you know, yeah. bought a book on Kickstarter and believed us that we could actually make it without screwing them over. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, that's the only reason we're alive, <clears throat> but, yeah, I really appreciate all that stuff, and it is really cool to have the book, you know, and have something that's real finally in our hands that we made ourselves. That's, like, <laughs> the coolest thing about it, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we're working for ourselves, but we're really working for the people that back us, like, the people that <laughs> made it happen. Like, we're just doing our best not to let them down. <laughs> yeah. I'd actually be really curious as to like the I don't know kind of like the writing process you did for like a, a lot of the comedic stuff like because in my opinion like comedy especially like good comedy is some of the hardest to write just because you know you gotta I don't know you can't really try hard at it you just kind of have to let it be natural and be stupid. Yeah, you definitely can't try. Um, not like to the point where you're rewriting stuff all the time. It has mm -hmm. to feel pretty organic. But uh, well. Because me and Dan have been friends since we were like 13, we we've been joking around since then. So you know we know each other like you know as well as you can know somebody. So neither of us are offended when we come up with stupid ideas. Our whole process is we just improvise the entire comic. Like we have a framework of what we know is going to happen. We know that we're going to hit these few story points, but if we come up with something better, we'll change it along the way but we know the arc of the characters generally. We're not to a place where we're like stuck in it, but we have these basic like names, like we'll name all the issues before we do them even, or to some extent we'll like name them kind of thing so we know what we're getting into when we do it. Um, and then we just go back and forth on Skype. So he'll say a line that a character might say, and I'll be another character, and I'll say a line, and then if my line sucks or Dan's line sucks, we'll try and outdo that line. And then as we're improvising them, like Dan will be typing them out, and then we look through it and we read it, and then we go like, okay, cool, let's put that in the book, let's like make it a real thing. So after we've improvised the whole thing, we make a structure out of it and use all the improvised lines in the form of like a comic and then we put the script together based on that, if that makes any sense. So we just kind of like run through it and then cut some of the shitty stuff and then just compile it together into something that works scene by scene. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it really worked because like you, it sounds like you took like kind of like a loose framework and then from there you just kind of winged it. And yeah. because of that, it seemed like it, like a lot of the jokes like from what, because I, I read a little bit of it and like it seemed like it was, really natural, it was funny, like it came across like a, um, it never seemed like it was like trying too hard and I think that really came across well. Yeah, we wanted to make it feel like, I mean just like it is, like just two people having a conversation kind of thing, like just a group of friends who know each other hanging out and just like making fun of shit or making fun of each other or like, you know, you have some idiot friend there and you're just like shitting on them in front of everyone and people are like, ragging on them too like that kind of feeling that we had growing up with like everybody we knew like that was the whole thing was it like you just you have somebody say something fucking lame and you just shit on them for like 10 minutes just ruin their world and then yeah like that's funny 
So <laughs> that's pretty much like what we did for it. We just tried to make it feel like how we were as kids, how we were with our friends, and yeah, you know, like some of the lines from it are literally things that we heard growing up. Mm. But I think those are like the best things to pull from because those are like so unique to you. Oh, they're real too. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, you know it works because it worked. You you witnessed it work. <laughs> yeah, we had this one the one line that st- sticks out to me. It's not like a super funny line, but uh, we have this nerdy friend who used to like make believe he was Legolas in the woods and stuff when he was a kid. Just oh like God. you know, funny stuff, Sh- shit you'd make fun of <laughs> if you saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Like alone, alone in the woods, being Legolas, like shooting invisible arrows, and you just in the distance laughing to yourself. So my friend went into his room and he had a dragon lamp in the room, and uh, you could feel like this kid hated the idea that people were in his room, like judging him on the lame shit that he had. <laughs> so, so my friend goes, "So uh, this is your room?" And he goes, "Yeah." And he goes, "And that's a dragon lamp. How's that working for you?" <laughs> And he could just feel his whole like being crumbling in on himself, like so, oh. <laughs> so ashamed. <laughs> it's stuff like that that I like, like little things that are just real, that feels like a real thing that happened. Like anytime you can do that in the script, like that makes it better. But yeah, definitely. Like I mean, it's like oh, the one thing I'm kind of curious. This is like a kind of a personal question, but like how many of the experiences like growing up, especially like. I heard the one where you said your mom and, like, some of her friends tried to, like, do the exorcism or whatever, and I almost, I don't know, like, how, how much of that did you, like, try to bring in, like, some of this? Um, it's not anything specific. It's more of, like, the feeling of those people. Yeah. Uh, like, we have a... I actually think our audio book that's coming out with the book that we're releasing, like, really soon to all the Kickstarter backers. We're just waiting for people in Canada to get their books. But, like, the audio book goes into it a bit more. It's kind of like uh, the narrator is his own character who he, like, does a commentary on the book as he's doing it. So, like, we do all the character voices. So, like, we each play roles and whatever. So we kind of, like, it's not an explanation or anything, but he'll just kind of, like, go off on his own tangents about shit. And that kind of goes more into, like, descriptions about the people in the world. And uh, some of them are based on, like, the church people that I knew growing up who were, like, fucking insane, who just did (laughs) crazy shit. (laughs) Like, the exorcism shit. Like, there's this, uh, you know, trailer park lady in there and uh, in the Steve Lishman book. And, you know, she does, like, dumb stuff where, like, this dude's about to, like, beat the shit out of Dracula and she runs out of the house to try and get him away from this. She's like, Tommy, come inside. The mac and cheese is getting cold. Don't kill him. <laughs> like, stuff like that. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, like that's a real thing. Like, it didn't happen, but I was there for that. Like, <laughs> I've been to trailer park. I've seen a woman poop in a trash can while high on drugs. Like, oh. I've seen things. <laughs> like, I know what to base it off of, but I'm not directly using anything. It's just kind of like you have a character mold and you just plug in stuff to it. You just, like, I can put myself into that person <laughs> and then just talk through them, like, stupid shit that they would say because I was just so used to it growing up. But, yeah, we have, like, There's a more, weird... You mean, like, the essence of them. Yeah, it's, like, the essence of the person. Like, that's more or less what you're doing. Some stuff is direct. Some stuff is just, like, you know, a roundabout way to make fun of these people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we've had friends contact us and be like, am I this character? Oh my God. <laughs> so how do you respond to that? Do you just like... Just go, I don't know, man. It's like a culmination of a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth of it. It's not any one person. It's like everybody. You know, we also make fun of ourselves, too. Mm. Yeah. I think you have to with this sort of thing. You know, if you're going to make fun of other people, you got to be willing to rag on yourself. Oh, yeah. We <laughs> shit on ourselves all the time. <laughs> Definitely. It seems like it was, like, a really fun experience to just, like, I don't know, actually piece that whole book together. Like, how, how long, like, I know you said you gave me a time frame for, like, how long it took you to do the second book, like, in terms of, like, the illustrations, like, how long you have to. But in the beginning, when you were still kind of, I guess, learning comics as you went, like, did that, how long, that, how long did that take you? Um, well, comics... 
compositionally, like the way that you're supposed to do it? Like I know you mean like in a general sense, but like we both went to a comic book course in a in Boston <laughs> when we were younger. We went to uh, which one was it? It was the do, 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 some Boston illustration school. I can't remember. We took a summer course there with Nick Dragata, who is a Marvel Comics artist, and he was teaching the basics of like making comic books and how to design your compositions, how to do thumbnails and all that. And um, this was back when we wanted to do our original comic idea from when we were in high school. And um, we we took that course and learned the basics. And from there, I learned, you know, obviously other stuff about more traditional artwork and more like traditional illustration stuff. But it's the same kind of thing. It's like when you look at a page, it's a composition. So like you have to guide the eye through it. You do that by like word bubbles and then, you know, timing and the piece is done by like bigger frames and things like that. Like you make spaces for the eye to sit for longer so that like a joke lands better, mm -hmm. things like that. But uh, in terms of like the writing and stuff, like for writing the book, it probably took us mm, a couple months, maybe like two months, something like that. But that's just because, like, you know, we had breaks. We write really fast, though. Like, we write, we almost wrote the entire book, too, in, in just a couple times sitting down. Like, we maybe did it in, like, two weeks' time or something like that. Yeah, it's like you'd have, like, a burst or whatever of just, like, you know, you start one idea and it would, like, snowball and just, like, basically get kind of out of control and then you'd well, have we, it pretty much done. We have yeah. just so many ideas about stuff we want to do that we have to stop and edit them. We can't. We can't have so many. You gotta stories. reel it in. Yeah, because we'll go way off the rails and do like all kinds of stupid shit, and it'll just get to the point where it's unmanageable. Like we have a Lost Boys part of like the first book uh, with like Kiefer Sutherland, and yeah. um, you know, like yeah. the main character, main bad vampire of Lost Boys, and uh, that yeah. part was like just a piece of it. And we took a lot of it and moved it over into book two. But, like, I originally we had, like, three or four different storylines going on at the same time. And we had to, like, edit everything down. But that's most of what it is. It's too many ideas. So we'll get on to, we'll get on to like, a conversation where we're just improvising new characters. And then we're, like, and then this thing shows up and he does this. Or, like, we'll find, like, a funny old 70s D&D &D character that's really fucking lame. And we'll just bring him in and be like, wouldn't it be funny if he were there and he did this, this, and this? You know, like, yeah. wouldn't it be funny if, like, this character, Don Wheeler, shows up and, like, he turns into, like, this cat because this dude's all fucked up on drugs and, you know, he's telling him to, like, <laughs> you know, he wants to, like, sleep with him and stuff. It's, like, all this weird shit. And we have all little things like that that happen over and over and we're like, okay, that one's for book three or that one's for book two. We can fit that in somewhere, this joke here or whatever. But, uh... I think it's fun that you do it so organically, like, uh, instead of just, like, having some kind of, like, refined... I guess well, since it's comedic, like, it doesn't need, like, a, like, substance, like, plot, you know, structure. <laughs> but, yeah, like, it's I just mean, kind you of need it. You need, like, a framework to put it in so you can't get too crazy. But it is super organic. Like once we are the characters, it gets like terrible. <laughs> <laughs> terrible in the best sense, basically. It, I, yeah. It'd probably be fun to like listen to like one of your hash out sessions, <laughs> like just coming up with shit. <laughs> Dude, once we start talking, like the book two parts that get into like loneliness. Oh boy, it's like oh, the man. worst shit ever. Like single dude stuff. It's. <laughs> If we had a publisher, it would never happen. Like, it would never go into a book. But we control it, so we're like, hey, I'm down to make people uncomfortable. Let's do it. Yeah, like, you, you should totally you know. put a file, like, at the end of your audio book for, like, say, book two, where it's, like, outtakes, and it's literally just a couple of your, like, hash-out sessions where you just go <laughs> Yeah, yeah we want just... we, We'd like to do that, but the thing is, is that we, like, we break a lot, but the thing is, like, we do voices, for the characters and stuff. Um, so when we do it, like, we do break a lot, but we didn't want to include that because everything about the experience is, like, we, we want the book to feel like a book that exists without us. Like, we don't even put our names on it. Like, <laughs> yeah. our names are in tiny print in the legal section because we have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in our world, like, our perfect world, we would not be involved in this. Like, it would just be 
we are we're just Steve Lynchman. Yeah, Steve Lynchman. <laughs> and uh, the audiobook too is like it was, we want to make it feel real. So like this character, Clarence Wetmouth the third. He's the, <laughs> he's the narrator, and uh, he exists on his own. He has his own favorite things. He has his own prejudices. He is, he's, you know, he has his own problems, secret homophobic tendencies, and like all kinds of stuff. Like we love all of that kind of thing. Like just to keep it into its own like little world where, because you can get away with anything if they're characters. Like you can make fun of stuff. You can be like. You know, because everybody knows somebody like that who's like a little too forward about the things that they're uncomfortable with, a little too, <laughs> yeah, like just a little too horrible. <laughs> no, I mean, actually, that brings up like a a couple like ideas that I don't know. I, I've actually rolled over in my head in the past, and it was <clears throat> with like Steve Lichman. It's it seems like you've kind of like taken these characters, and they're it's like they're monsters in a basement. And, or in a dungeon, and yeah. you... It, it's like the monsters you come across in a game whose only existence is just to get murdered. Mm-hmm. And they don't, like, have, like, any other purpose, like, outside of that. So it's like you're exploring, like, what they do when they don't come across, like, any enemies or anything like that. Like Their day-to-day life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah but, they, they suffer from depression. They have all kinds of problems. <laughs> Social anxieties. Yeah, it was like the first one that I read was like really pretty funny where like that, I don't know, the warrior like steps in and, you know, Steve Lichman's like, oh, I haven't seen anyone in, I don't know, however many years or whatever. And he's like begging for death. Yeah. And that warrior guy like, <laughs> now that he doesn't kill him or something. Yeah, um, like I, I love that kind of thing. I like that, like because it's, like if you go and you put, that kind of stuff into people that are normal, like how you would talk to your friends and all that. Like, it's how I would talk to Dracula. Like, that's how we, like, do stuff. Like, if Dracula were a character standing in front of me, I'd be like, dude, you raped girls. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd be like, no, man, I fly, I go into their room at night and I, I you know, like, I cast a spell over their mind that removes <laughs> all choice from the equation. And I'm like, nah, dude, that's called rape. You know what I mean? Like, that, that's what I would do. So that's how we kind of do the comic. Like, if he were one of our friends, like, how would we make fun of him? Like, how would we, like, shit on this guy? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, like, that's, that's like, the funnest part. You know, like, it's just taking, like, monster characters and putting them into this, like, real-world scenario and just shitting on it. Like, uh, you know, like, yeah. D&D, like, both of us, you know, like, we get why it's cool, but we also like to make fun of it. So it's... You know, like making the warrior guys like all like real high fantasy, They're like oh ha ha, you know, like I rolled a six and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> While there's like a dead body of somebody's like loved one on the ground, <laughs> like they're rolling <laughs> to like steal his shit. Like I love that kind of idea that they're just super insensitive, but they're like high fantasy, like innocence. Yeah, yeah. things like that are cool that you can just like take it and put it into the real world. But yeah, like the the whole thrust of the comic is that they're a bunch of high school kids dealing with like lame shit, but they're monsters. It's like they're just losers, like you said, like losers in a basement, and the basement's a dungeon. <laughs> so <laughs> it was puzzling, like how you said, uh, like I I think it also adds that extra layer of like you know this is this is like a real thing, like like it, it was something that uh where you said you keep your names like in the little print and like, or like that's like the only place you would put them because you want it to feel like a real world. Yeah. And like that was something that I always actually struggled with when it comes to movies where it was, uh, um, yeah, you'd go see it, it'd be a big epic experience or whatever. You'd be like, Oh, this character dies. You'd be like, Oh, but this actress over here on the red carpet, you know, and you're just, I don't know. You, you get like a, I don't know. You can be like a little taken out of it in a way. Like, cause now this act, like this, person isn't actually this character. He's just this actor that plays this character. And I mean, while everyone knows that's true, it can be kind of, I don't know, it can kind of block you away from the... Yeah, it's like when somebody's a little too famous and they're in too little of a role in a movie and they're supposed to, like, trick me into thinking there's somebody else and I'm like, nah, that's Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I see you. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, we want to make it we don't want to put our names in front of it. Like, I, I don't like that. Like, if you go to our Kickstarter, like, if you 
anybody watching this, if you go to like the Steve Lichman Kickstarter and you go through it, like you'll see that the whole thing is in the style of the comic. Like mm -hmm. we talk and stuff in it, but we're also drawn as characters and there's no photos or anything of anything that's going to be in the Kickstarter because we want it to all feel like it's in a comic book world. And, uh, you know, yeah. in all aspects of the book, like it's designed to be yeah, that like way. a full immersion. Yeah. Yeah, like you're just in that world when you're reading that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Like that's, I don't know, I, I, I like how you like put him in like all those other different, like you know, the different costumes in order to kind of like promote it. Like you were uh, like Steve McFly. The Steve Jobs one was ridiculous. <laughs> I cried. <laughs> oh my god! And a uh, uh, one of uh, one of my friends who's actually one of your uh, uh, the old Crimson Dagger people uh, that used to follow you, like uh, what's it, Harry Osborne? He did the he did the Steve Lichman thing, like the advertisement thing. Like he uh, he was gonna do a Steve Lichman thing for me, <laughs> just just for this particular <laughs> interview, but <laughs> he didn't get finished. With it. Oh. God damn it! Yeah, it would have been. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I like. Uh, it's been cool. We've had some. Uh, we have some weird stuff. You know, like we've had fan art and things, but we've had people um, go in and do like their own audiobooks of it. Really? Which is kind of weird. Like they've been doing like issues where they just play the characters, and so we uh, we're actually doing this thing that. I haven't really like announced it or anything, but it's not too big a deal. Where we want to release the whole transcript for the uh, the whole audiobook so that people can do it themselves, like do it live or whatever, do it with their friends and just play different characters. Mm -hmm. That's going to be pretty cool. We're also going to do some kind of live thing ourselves with the whole thing where we do monster voices and stuff, and it's going to be horrible. It's going to be the worst thing <laughs> ever, and I can't wait to do that. I'm going to blow my voice out like so hard. That's gonna be great, though. Like, I mean, <laughs> that, that's gotta feel pretty crazy. Like, in thinking about, uh, like, you know, we we as artists, we all do fan art on occasion, but now you're actually getting some people doing fan art of your stuff. Yeah, we actually got people who got tattoos of Steve, which is weird. Oh wow, uh, like, that's crazy. Like, yeah, it's you, you cool. got some hardcore devouts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like some people are really into it, and we got a Steve Lichman cosplay the other day. That was pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's cool to see that, like, people, I don't know, like, not that, it, like, I don't have any illusion about what it is, like, I don't, I don't want to be one of those people that, like, Steve Lichman is like a world, like, I don't want to do that, <laughs> like, I'm just saying, it's cool that people get into it, like, it's cool that people, yeah, that it resonates with them, it's yeah, yeah that, like, they feel, like, you know, invested in it, and they want to, like, see what happens and stuff, like, I've never had that before, where anybody's, you know, seen my stuff or, you know, like any kind of comics I did online and been like involved in some way. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting just to, like the the interaction you have with people who just are into the book and they're doing things of, on their own, just like coming up with their own shit. Like I love it. What about a? <clears throat> I mean, I, I know that you kind of went that direction with like the the Starvale thing there for a while. Like, is that gonna come back around eventually, or are you gonna just? Yeah, what... it'll come back around. the The thing is, is that we've already written, we've written a couple books now, and um, we've learned so much from writing and editing and all that. So it's like when I like we wrote Skull and Shark together, we rewrote it like four times, and uh, we really liked the script when we did it. And, you know, now looking back on it, we're like, oh, we've learned a lot. Like, we were kind of insecure at first. And, um, you know, and the same thing with the Starville script. Like, I wrote the Starville script. Just I was like, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm just going to write this script. It's like 100-something pages. I don't know. It's really long. But mm -hmm. I, like, wrote the whole thing in two weeks. I just sat down at the computer and wrote every day. And, um, like it's cool to get that first draft kind of stuff out there and to just get through all the dumb ideas. <laughs> but, like, at first we were kind of... Like, I don't know if insecure is the right word, but we were hesitant about a bunch of stuff. Like, I don't know if we were, like, too too reserved in, like, how far we went with, like, what we said about being, like, lame people. Because you got to be lame. If you're going to do a serious book, you got to be, like, willing to get fucking lame. 
like mm-hmm. to say like serious lines to your friend as if you're like in a dramatic moment in a book. Like, <laughs> can you even imagine doing that? <laughs> yeah. Like, if you're in a like where like a, the love interest is about to die and the guy's talking to her and we're like improvising lines back and forth. <laughs> like, so I hope somebody comes and just beats us up. Like, I hope yeah. I hope everybody yeah. from the area has like this sixth sense and they just know that we're here and they come and kick our ass. <laughs> Like, that's what it feels like. Like, some justice has to happen. Somebody has to stop us. Um, it must, it must we, be a completely different animal than doing, like, the comedic. <laughs> yeah, because... But that's the thing, is, like, we learn so much doing the scripts on, like, being ourselves and, like, how we write, like, how we talk to each other, like, how the story flows. You know, like, once you get an idea of how you do that kind of stuff naturally without forcing it, then, you know, you kind of have to go back and redo all that other stuff. So, like, for Starvale, the script is, you know, it was done, and I was having Dan go over it and send me all his, like, revisions of stuff that he hated, whatever. <laughs> like, I was just like, it's too hard to be this lame <laughs> to another human being, so I'm just going to write it <laughs> and then just send it to Dan, and Dan can fix what he wants <laughs> and send it back to me, and then I can fix it again. It's like, I'd rather do it like that, but now we're so comfortable just bombing and saying lame stuff to each other that I'm like, yeah, we have to redo all that stuff. We have to redo Skull and Shark, redo yeah. Starvale, so it's still think, coming, but... I wow. think I feel a lot better about going into Skull and Shark as well, like after having uh, done a couple comics already and like a couple books, you know, you're, <clears throat> you will have it, like when you're go- doing something that requires that, that painterly style, you don't want to have to go back and question everything, you're just going to have to just, I don't know, do it and get it done because it, going over and redoing every page and panel would take so much effort. Yeah. yeah. At this point, it's like I've had so many things. I've had, like, really cool people that are, like, directors and stuff be like, oh, would you want to make a Skull and Shark thing? <laughs> like a Skull and Shark movie thing? And I'm just like, that's so tempting because to paint that whole book would kill me. And I don't want to, like, suffer through it. <laughs> like, I don't want to regret it. I'd rather write a movie script, like, a thousand times than, like, do an entire painted book <laughs> and, like, do revisions on it because yeah. it wasn't good enough or just have to put it out because it is at a certain level. But I've decided against that, and we're just going to do the comic and just going to nail down the script because you really can't. You can't just start... Like, I've seen so many people who... Um, you know, like, ever since we did the book, a bunch of people have come out and asked about, like, the process, and, like, they're interested in doing something similar, so they're like, oh, what do you do to, you know, finish whatever, and how do you structure your process, and, you know, like, how do you build to the final, and whatever, so I just say get every single thing that you can down, prepare as much as possible, always be prepared for the whole thing, like, Know what you're getting into because the amount of work that you're going to put in to make it happen, to do all of the paintings, the drawings, whatever, it's so huge that something as simple as just doing a rewrite is going to feel like nothing compared to that. It, so you have to have that stuff nailed down. You just you have to you have to be happy with the script. You know, read it three times, show people, <laughs> just be like, is this good? <laughs> do you like any of this? Is this working? <laughs> yeah. I mean, after a certain point, you just need to do something. Mm. Like, I don't think that Steve Lichman's, like, the best thing we're ever going to do. Like, I just don't think that that's the case. Like, uh, you know, book two is already better than book one. Um, book three is going to probably be better than book two. Because yeah. you're just learning and, you know, challenging yourself to do something else, and you're becoming more, like, accustomed with how you work in general anyway. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think moving forward, it's like you just have to get the thing out after a certain point, so do as much as you can. Work as hard as you can and build up to that place, and then hopefully when you do it, it's it works to some extent, but then know that whatever you do after that is going to be infinitely better, you know, because you have to just, you know, <laughs> shit it out. <laughs> like you have, It's like you have to just get it done, or else you'll never do anything, and then you know, you'll be, like, so afraid to fail the whole time that by the time you're, you know, Definitely. regretting never doing it, you're going to be old. Yeah, I think that's a better approach, too, for, like, you know, just the fact that, I mean, you'll have the book done and you can actually, like, pre- you can present it and you're already, like, 
ready to go basically before you tell like a lot of people even about it. So that way, I don't know, you don't really overpromise. Kind of like what we were talking about before we came on here about just, you know, you say you're going to do something, then you don't do it because you get that feeling of like kind of gratification or whatever. But then if you just go ahead and do it, you get it done and you didn't tell anybody about it, you didn't promise anything that you couldn't keep. Yeah, you want to just, yeah, I mean like it's better to deliver a full experience in like one whole contained book than to do okay here's the problem I made we made Skull and Shark I made a trailer for it and I did that before doing that much stuff like I just did some stuff I didn't know I don't know how to make a book you know what I mean like back then I was like just whatever mm -hmm. like just make something that's cool and um, did the trailer and it created expectations mm -hmm. and uh, that's the worst thing you can do is put something out before you're a hundred percent sure what it is. Like I think the script is going to be cooler than it, and you know by the time we do the rewrites, I think it'll be fine. But like at the time when I did it, it was, it's like I, my level of being able to like make this trailer cool with the music and you know the drawings and stuff, like it was way higher above my my yeah. like writing ability. Like, I'm not going to be able to match this with good writing. Like, I'm just not a good writer. How could I? So, yeah, it yeah. was, I don't know. It was just like, yeah, that will never measure up to how cool that thing is. So if you have the complete package and you put it out, I think it's better because people aren't judging it based off of something that they've come up with in their own imagination of what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I completely agree. Like, I mean, I think that was more of a, uh, I, I can't imagine like, you know, like, I, like creating expectations on like a project that you're trying to spend so much time on and then like getting that extra added, like that extra added pressure of just everyone like pointing the finger at you while you're doing this thing. Mm. Uh, it's just, I don't know, it's too much pressure just to create something in, in itself rather than trying to like stack bricks on top of your head while you do it. Yeah, then they also have that have time to speculate, there. and if their speculation is better than the complete product <laughs> that you've made. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing, is that if you put it out there and you're like, oh, this is what it's going to be, kind of, everybody's waiting for that thing, and some people, yeah, they have better ideas. They're making theories, they're, be. they're going through it, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's going to be like a Streets of Rage comic book and like all this stuff, and you're like, eh, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, who knows? Yeah, and plus, I, I could also block you off to like you know potentially doing like taking it a different direction than you initially had wanted to. And, you know, yeah, you don't, you don't want to limit yourself, especially creatively. Like, who wants to do that? Yeah, you want to be able to just like go off the rails and have fun because, like, with Steve Lichman, nobody expected anything, and it was <laughs> just like, all right, yeah, you just want it to be more of this kind of stuff all we can do is over deliver on this like all we can do is introduce more stuff we can keep going and making weirder stuff keep making story elements that are gonna make it more interesting it's like you know when it's just jokes like yeah you can do a lot with that but, just keep escalating <laughs> but if all it is is called skull and shark and that's why people like it they don't like it because of like a joke <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. it's like oh you're just you only like it because of the character and everything else around that is its own thing. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the, is is the Skull and Shark like is is that one more? I mean, not that it's greater than any of your other projects, but like, is that more of uh, your your passion project? I guess because it seems like that one's been around a lot longer than the other ones that you had, you know, spend time working on. Um. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be more like. It's going to be more of like a serious project, like we're going to put everything into it. Yeah, it seemed like um, it had more weight on it. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be like its own thing, um, but it's not what everybody thinks it is, which is like, I, I can't tell you how many messages I got. I got so many messages when we put that stuff out there. I mean, I mean not... Not when it came out, but like when that Kung Fury thing came out and everybody was like, oh, you're going to love this. And I was like, no, I'm not. Like, <laughs> like I get it. It's like, you know, slapstick, whatever, nostalgia jokes. But, like, 
I don't I, like when stuff is just making fun of that kind of thing. Like, that's not what made those things cool to me. Like, all the old, um, you know, like, you guys just say, like, retro movies, B-movies, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, that stuff wasn't funny to me when I was a kid. Like, I thought it was so fucking cool. Like, I didn't, like, I don't want to make fun of why that stuff is cool. Like, I don't like all, like, the, isn't this cheesy? Isn't, like, and that's, like, the butt <laughs> of the joke is, oh, it's so cheesy. Yeah, it's better for it to be funny on its own, you know, rather than, like, if you're making fun of it, then it's like you are, you know, they, like, the movie expects you to laugh with it, rather than, like, this thing is being itself, you know, and you're just, basically, yeah, yeah you, I mean, you're laughing at how stupid they are naturally. Yeah, you're never going to make a better funny movie than Miami Connection, if you've ever seen that. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's like Miami Connection is funny on its own. Like, it doesn't... It's not trying to be funny, but that's why it's funny. And mm-hmm. you can't fake that. You yeah. can't fake that successfully. So, like, we're not going to... Skull and Shark's not going to be like, ha, ha, yeah. ha, isn't the 80s funny? Like, it's not that book. Like, it's going to be... It's going to be everything I think is cool about that era, but not for the sake of that. There's going to be a story that's cool. And, um, yeah, like, I just, yeah, I hated that. I hated how everything went in that direction. Everything was, like, the, you know, like, the grid lines and, like, you know, you have, like, the Far Cry, whatever, Blood Dragon thing, and then you had... Oh, God, yeah. It's, like, everything is just, it's... It almost feels like ashamed of what it's like trying to be. Yeah, that's. I, I'm sorry. That's weird. Yeah, that was kind of what I was thinking about. Like, uh, this kind of goes back to what you were saying about the Power Ranger posters or whatever. Like, when I saw the designs, like there for a minute, like it, you can't help but think that, like, when they shift design so much on something like that that's already established and that people like, when they shift the designs, it's almost like they're ashamed of themselves. Yeah, a little bit and. It, That's the it, thing that I hate the most about all of the like cool direction that things try to go in. It's like it's not cool to be ashamed. It's not cool to be insecure, first of all. Yes. So it's like it feels insecure when you over design something or like try and make it cool, then it feels not cool. Because it's not confident. And that's like the that. thing was that? All the purity of it is just, like, dead. <laughs> yeah, like, the thing is that, like, the Power Rangers have a really solid design in and of, them, of themselves. Like, the original designs are pretty great. Like, they're simple, but, like, whatever. It is what it is. It's a different level of expectations. And, um, you know, they're ninjas with motorcycle helmets. Like, what more could you ask for? Uh, <laughs> but, like, things like the Superman movie when it came out, Man of Steel. Oh, okay. God. He's like wearing the outfit and he comes down, he's talking to Lois Lane and she's like, oh, what does the S stand for? And he's like, on my planet it stands for hope. And it's like, get the fuck out of here. It stands for (laughs) Superman, you idiot. Like, are you kidding me? It stands for hope? Like, no, it's a big stupid S for Superman because you're, you're from like the golden age. Like... Just embrace it. Just be Superman. Just call yourself... Yeah, it stands for Superman. Isn't that lame? It's just Dark Knight. It's just, it's just trying to Dark Knight everything, where it's like everything has to have like some kind of explanation. And where they're like, no, I'm not a loser. It stands for hope. It just happens to look like an Earth S. Like, well, go fuck yourself, dude. It was the same thing, the, it was the same thing they did with the first uh, re- reiteration of the Ninja Turtle designs, too. Like, I, Oh, my God. Like, I, I don't know. Those weren't, I mean, they're not, I guess, not as bad in terms of, like, what they do with, like, the Power Ranger thing, like, where it's, like, more of a shift, but, like, the lips and everything else. Like, yeah. you could have, I mean, I, I know, like, you go back to, like, what you did with them. If they just looked more classic, I would have personally enjoyed them much more. Well, I think it's just that, you know, it's like what Marvel does. Marvel doesn't change the designs. They just stick with what the comics did. And everybody loves it. Like, there's nothing... Like, just adapt them. <laughs> Everything in the Marvel Comics uh, movie universe, like, they all look, for the most part, like the comic books. And that's awesome. Like, when Winter Soldier showed up and he looked like Winter Soldier, I was like, fucking yes! He has the 90s metal arm, are you kidding me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's the coolest shit ever. I was like, fucking yeah! That gave me so much hope for Cable. I was like, fuck, they're gonna nail this. 
and, and that was like what they did with it. <laughs> yeah, that was like what they did with the like. I think there was actually a legit quote from the movie where they were like, "It's like some dude, and he has a metal arm." Yeah, and like it was supposed like, to be scary. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it was extremely direct, and, and it just it works. Like that just shows that you shouldn't shy away from what you have initially already established and just kind of roll with it. Like you know, it's people are gonna enjoy it. We're in the entertainment business. We're not really in the, you know, not everything has to make sense business. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, we're at about we're at about a couple hours now. Uh, I don't know. Is there? We usually do like a thing. Was like the one last. I don't know the something that you parting say. words of wisdom. <laughs> yeah. Parting words of wisdom. Okay. Um, it's like it the stuff. It's just, just wing. <laughs> well, my words of wisdom are basically just you're going to be dead soon. Like, whether or not you want to think about that, you're totally going to be dead soon. Mm -hmm. And let me just put it this way I just started making books, and I'm going to be 30 next year. And that means I can only probably put out like, I don't know, maybe like 35 more books. <laughs> and then I'm, then I'm probably done. So it's like, you got to really take this shit seriously. It's like if you're waiting to study, if you're waiting to be somebody, if you're waiting for everything to be perfect, nothing's ever going to be perfect. And shit's always going to get way harder. And... You know, it's like you, you keep going, you keep doing the things that you want to do. It's like if you're studying, you're working hard, it's like you're waiting for this break and you think that, like, you're trying to get to some kind of goal. But that never comes. It's not a goal. You know, you're working for the road. You're working for the way there. You're working for the process. It's like you're not working for a finish line. Finish line will never come. There will always be something to strive for. So... You know, you're waiting for things to be perfect in order to get moving and start doing something real for yourself. But in reality, that'll just never, ever happen. And before you know it, it's going to be too late to do anything. So while you have the time right now, no matter how old you are or whatever, if you have a dream of something that you want to do, do your best to do that thing. Take in as much knowledge as possible. Read books. You know, like Take in experiences. Go to places where artists are doing things that you want to do. Go to workshops. Attend these things. Like, go out of your way to meet people. Make groups. Get other people to help you stay motivated. You know, get into a rhythm. Dedicate yourself to something. You know, when you get into a mode of doing something, you're studying every day. Like, if you finally get to that point and you're working really hard, then make every aspect of your life of your life like that. You know, like start exercising every day and the same kind of thing. Like, make your whole life motivated and structured, get into that rhythm where it becomes the new normal because that'll happen over and over and over. So it's like, you know, for me right now, like we have the publishing company, we're shipping things and doing all this other stuff while making another book, while taking on client work, you know, while I'm like planning a wedding and whatever. And I'm sure that the next step beyond this will be even harder than that. <laughs> it's like, but you either rise to the occasion and do it or you don't. Yeah. You set yourself a goal and you just do it no matter the circumstance to the best of your ability and keep moving on. You're never going to reach an end destination. Yep. It's, it's all about the climb. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, don't be a, just don't be a wimp. Definitely. I think that's a great note to leave it on. <laughs> the, uh, well, Dave, uh, well, thanks so much for coming on and you know chatting with us, man. It's been awesome. Of course. Yeah, dude, you've been great. Uh, anybody who you know wants to check out uh, any of Dave's stuff, you know, you can pretty much just Google him, Dave Raposa, or you can check out his uh, his Twitch. It's under Steve Lichman, and he also has a couple of Gumroad tutorials up for sale. So, if you, uh, all, the, all the links will be in the description. So, anybody that wants that, just you know, check it out. And now, yeah, Dave, thanks so much again for coming on, man. I know you're super busy. Uh, well, I had fun talking to you guys. It has been... Travis. It has been... <laughs> yeah. Thank you for talking with me. Uh, dude, anytime. And, you know... Everybody, we'll, uh, we'll catch you next time and, you know, keep working. Yeah. <laughs>